That's Darsh Preet Singh, who's a basketball player at Trinity University in Texas. Mm -hmm. Military, this is the US military, not the Indian military. It wouldn't be really that big a deal if that was a picture of somebody in the Indian military. We're only about two to, two to three percent of the Indian population. We're probably just under 30 percent of the Indian military. Mm -hmm. uh, this is actually the US military, and he is a military doctor. And then, uh, this is Narendra Kapani. Uh, we actually know him pretty well. He's really basic. His basic claim to fame is Captronics, is his Silicon Valley company that put out the first ideas of fiber optics. Um, so he has one of the patents on fiber optics. Uh, beautiful home. But anyway, that's true. <laughs> Politicians. This is the Prime Minister of India. Uh, and doctors, me. Lawyers, my wife, uh, filmmakers, um, farmers, and that's really our sort of claim to fame in India. We are the farmers, and that's really one of the things that brought us over to this country besides building the railroads was farming. In this country, the largest farms for peaches, raisins, sorghum are actually Punjabi farmers. Six farmers. All right, this is, this is called. Prezi motion sickness. <laughs> if where in the world are we? So obviously a majority of us are in India, particularly the northwest portion of India. But you can see there has been pretty impressive uh, migration patterns to areas that you just really wouldn't consider. England has a large contingency. The US probably has about half a million. But the uh, Sikhs have gone. There's quite a few in Kenya uh, and towards Australia. Okay, so this I tried. Let's see if this works. We tried to Google Earth movie thing. So if it works, I'll be very proud. <laughs> so this is India. As we zoom in, we're moving towards the northwest corner. Now you can see two labels of Punjab. So the state of Punjab was split in half with partitions of <coughs> that Punjab as part of Pakistan. This Punjab is part of India. As we zoom in on uh, Amritsar, the city, in the middle is the Golden Temple and its large uh, tranquility pool essentially around it. It started out as a lake that many holy men had visited. Buddha was uh, apparently uh, a resident for a while. Um, and many of our teachers spent many uh, months there meditating before it formally became part of the Golden Temple complex. You can see that there's a lot of gold. This is all gold. You can see that there are many architectural influences here uh, from different cultures. No, that was the end. I, I, I got too flustered. I had to stop it. So there it is. Uh, this is the entire complex uh, with the um, uh, area to walk around one entrance, but you will see that there are four doors. This is the main door, but there's a door here on the other side as well. Here's it from the other side. Here's the door here. And the religious seat is here. The political seat is here. You can see, though, that the key element here was that this, this was a place for people to come and feel peace. Mm -hmm. So this is not uncommon to see people sitting around the tranquility pool meditating. There's actually a very famous picture early morning of a Sikh gentleman standing in the, the tranquility pool, meditating, um, facing towards the Golden Temple. This is some of the extraordinary work. The temple has been damaged several times over the years, and each time it, it gets uh, uh, more beautiful. This is the inlay work here, and the marble, and then the hand um, fashioned gold. And this is the inside of the temple. You saw the picture in the movie. Uh, Here's where the Guru Granth Sahib uh, sits. There is a priest that tends to the Guru Granth Sahib. People come and make an offering. They can do a prayer. They can sit and listen to the hymns that are being sung. Uh, they're not in this picture, but there's usually a, a group of uh, people singing the hymns here, sitting on the floor. Um, but it's they're all across the way. Like oh, here they are. OK, sorry. And then the congregation is sitting behind them. And then I now turn it over. Uh, <laughs> I talked to uh, I talked to Harjit 
last night. But I said, um, you know, I said, let's do this, you know, we'll both present. And I asked him, I said, how long are you going to speak for? How long and did he, I go? And he said, five or ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to speak for 15, but I'm going to use his watch. <laughs> That was outstanding. That Sorry. was great. Sorry. That was great and uh, great information. And, and I'm going to be a, I'll be a bit brief because I think he's covered quite a bit. What, what I what I would want to take a few minutes and just share with you is you you've heard the history about Sikhism. You've heard a little bit about Sikhs in the U.S. And one of the things we find ourselves asking very often is where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Whenever um. Whenever we talk about 9-11 uh, as Sikhs, we think not just about 9-11, we think about 9-12 also. We have to. Because I, I saw the World Trade Center go down. I saw it go down. And 9-12 is important for, 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 as a Sikh community. 9-11 is very important, obviously. 9-12 is also important because we know what it feels like to have a turban on your head the day after 9-11. And you know, as, as we shared earlier, I worked for the one company for 20 years, 25 years. Some of you might remember AP, we used to run grocery stores. I worked for the same company for 20 years, 25 years. And I had some very, very good friends in the company. A lot of good friends, a lot of people that I'd grown up with, uh, folks that I started with working with part-time when I was very young. And on 9-11, I was working with those people, with those same friends. And uh, you know, people who would come to my wedding, people who would come to my home. Uh, on 9-12, I was a stranger to all of them. Mm -hmm. To the very people that I, that I care for, uh, that I'm very good friends with today as well. But on 9-12, on 9-12, I would actually walk by people who I'd been friends with for years and years, and as I'd walk by, I'd see a bit of disco. That type of thing. Not, probably not even conscious. So, when I think about, when Harjit thinks about, what our families think about where we are today, we have to ask ourselves, where do we go from here? I have two children. I have a son who's 23 and a daughter who's 16. And whenever, when my son was growing up, and at different times, at different conversations in the house, if ever, if you would do something, if you would like, you know, if my wife made some um, <coughs> food at home and he was, you know, he was really enjoying it, or if he said something that sounded anywhere remotely Indian, I'd say, you're an Indian. I said, you know, you're, you're just an Indian, aren't you? No, I'm not. I'm an American. I'm an American. He forgot he has a turn on his head. But the mentality of my 14-year-old son at the time was no different than your children when they were 14. They think, you know, Harjit and I, we think like Americans. We are Americans. I used to tell people all the time that I'm as red, white, and blue as you can be with a turban on your head. <laughs> because I am. You know, for, 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 for those of you who are in our age group, I mean, you know, we grew up playing stickball. <clears throat> we grew up on a summer camp. We grew up watching Happy Days on the Vernon Show. Right? We grew up as either Mech fans or Philly fans or Yankee fans or whatever else. No different. Remember baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet? That's how we grew up. That's how we grew up. We're no different. Right? Not quite convincing <laughs> 300 million people that. Which is what we, we actually, we proactively work on. And the one thing that we're very clear on is we live in the greatest country in the world. Now, I've had the good fortune of being able to move around a little bit and see different parts of the world. We live in the greatest, you know, there's no doubt in my mind, we live in the greatest country in the world. And <clears throat> having said that, we want to be a part of this country. We believe we contribute to the country in many different ways. Not just, you know, Hardy showed you professionally what we do. Um, the Sikh community in the US is, has a tremendous reputation for getting involved in civil functions, civil activities in their, in their communities. Whether it's a blood drive, whether it's feeding the homeless, whether it's volunteering on Christmas Day at hospitals, whatever it might be, food shelters. There are over 18 18 community kitchens that we run in Thanksgiving just on the east coast of the U.S. This is, this is just young, sick college students in this. There are 18 of them that are just on the east coast. And it's just a bunch of sick kids getting together saying, you know, we should do something. We should give back. 
But he talked about <clears throat> the reputation, the image that we have in India. It was very interesting because I lived in India the last five years, and there was a survey that was done in Bombay. Now, India, like, like any country in the world, it's not always safe to be out at night when you're alone, especially if you're a female. And there was actually a survey done in Bombay about, and they asked women what scared them and what made them safe. And the one thing they said was, if at night they were ever in trouble, the only time they would get in a taxi was if it was being driven by a Sikh man. They wouldn't get in a taxi if it wasn't driven by... Now this is Muslim women, Hindu women, Buddhist women, saying the only taxi we're going to get into is the one that's driven by a Sikh man. So our history is such. Hardeep talked about how long we've been in this country. We fought with the Allied forces. With valor. With courage. We fought with the Allied forces. Because we're very loyal. We believe in, we believe in the Constitution. <clears throat> we believe in the principles of this country. We subscribe to them. And I tell people all the time, the only difference between you and me is you got here a couple of years before I did. Because none of us were here 300 years ago. So that's the only difference. Right? You happen to get here, you know, your forefathers got here a few minutes before mine did. So we ask ourselves all the time, where do we go from? How do we become, how do we convince, which is, it's probably a bad word, but it's probably the right word. How do we convince everyone that we are as American as any one of you? We share and subscribe to the values that you subscribe to. We're Democrats and we're Republicans, right? You know, we think this country needs an overhaul just as much as you do, <laughs> right? Whether you're, regardless of what you believe. So, that's why we're here at a function like this today. <coughs> Joyce thanked us for coming. When we leave, we're going to thank Joyce for allowing us to be. We think this is a, a privilege for us to be able to share, to be able to talk, to be able to exchange ideas, to ask you what else can we do? How else can we, how else can we become further penetrating the community? How else can we share our ideas? We have no interest in making you all Sikhs. <laughs> in fact, our religion forbids conversion. We are not allowed to go out and convert. If somebody wants to become a Sikh, they're welcome to become a Sikh, but we have no interest in doing that. But we want to share our ideas. I think Rajiv made a wonderful point. We actually believe that all religions have merit. We subscribe to the Guru Granth Sahib that Rajiv talked about earlier, which is our, our holy book, has writings from all of our, from our Gurus, from our ten prophets, the prophets wrote there, but we also have writings in there from Muslim scholars, from Hindu poets. There was, there was no discrimination. So think about a religious book that I bow to every day, that Rajiv, our families, we bow to every day. It has writings of Hindu poets. And when we read a script or a verse from a Hindu poet, it's no different than if it was uttered by one of our gurus. Because that is the word, that's the holy word for us. So we find ourselves sometimes at a crossroads. The temptation is, when things like this happen, the temptation after what happened in Wisconsin, the temptation after what happened in, on nine, in, in later in September, because the repercussions of 9-11, the repercussions, when you think about a repercussion, when you think about, you know, did anything happen? Did, was there a Muslim who was hurt? Was there a Muslim man or a Muslim woman anywhere in the country? No. The only fatality that came out of 9-11 was a Sikh man who was murdered in Arizona. That was the only fatality that came directly as a result of 9-11. In Mesa, Arizona, a man named Babir Singh Sodi was killed. He operated a convenience store and he was killed because somebody thought that he was a Muslim. That was the only man. I had an incident. My nephews work in Manhattan. And my nephew said to me, he said, you know, he said, this happened about two months ago. He said, we are at work one day. They work in the financial district. And the building, there was some sort of an event in the building. They were on the 23rd, 24th floor in the building they were in. And all of a sudden, there's smoke. There's all sorts of things going on. Fire alarms go off. And my nephew said, we got really concerned. We started wondering what's going on. So they said, he said, you know, I got everybody off the floor. I said, let's go. We started running down the stairs, and, and all of a sudden there was some talk that maybe it's a bomb. Right? Financial center, downtown. So there's all sorts of noise, all sorts of concern. They're running downstairs. They get downstairs. 
and the entire building is emptying out. And there's all sorts of people wondering, was there a plane? What happened? There's a fire? There's a bomb? What happened? And all of a sudden, a police officer comes and taps my nephew on the shoulder and says, I don't know what happened up there, but you better get out of here. I don't want something to happen to you. Now think about that. He's, he's running out of the building because he's scared himself, thinking something's happened. And the police officer says, you better get out of here. I don't want there to be trouble when you get out. That's not the country you live in. It's not the country that, it's not the country and the foundation. And when you think about Thomas Jefferson, when you think about Abraham Lincoln, when you think about George Washington, think about Ronald Reagan even. <laughs> it's not the country that we believe in. It's not the values we believe in. Why should a young man who's at work, who runs out of a building scared, just like everybody else we told? And this is a police officer who, you know, who was looking out for him. He said, because I'm not sure if I can help you. So we find ourselves in a crossroad. It's like living in a house in the perfect neighborhood, <laughs> but the neighbors don't like you. And you want to be friends with them. <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's where we are. And what we're doing is, proactively, we want to share. Every one of us, one of the things we did when uh, the incident in Wisconsin happened was that every sick who was on Facebook put an article, some sort of an article, that one of the articles that came out, or put a half a dozen lines, a paragraph, on what just happened. We thought it was a great opportunity for us to educate. Social media is the best way to educate anybody today. So we did that. Anybody who was on Twitter, we started, we started to use Twitter more than Let's talk about who we are. Let's talk about what we represent. Let's talk about the fact that when this country hurts, we hurt. When you hurt, we hurt. Because we believe we're a part of the fiber of this country. So we're, we want to be proactive. We want to share. We're an open book. As you talked about our temple, the golden temple that he just showed you feeds over 100,000 people every day for free. You can go there tomorrow and have breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the next 10 years and not drop a penny and nobody will ever say a word to you. For the next 10 years, for the next 20 years. You can go to any one of our temples. Many, many temples, many mosques, many houses of worship have some sort of restriction. Any one of you can go to any one of our temples any time you want. You know, we only have one request. We'd say, please take your shoes off and please cover your head. You can stay as long as you want. You can eat lunch there every Saturday, every Sunday, every Friday night for the next 20 years. Nobody will ever ask you a word. You will never be asked to give a penny. <clears throat> In fact, when you're done eating, they'll say, please have some more. Please have some more. Can we get you something else? Because as you talked about, we serve. People sit on the floor and they get served. And when you're done, somebody will come to you and say, did you like it? Would you like to take something home with you? And if you said yes for the next 20 years, you'll be given food to take home with you. We're open. We want to share. We'd love for you to share as well. We want to get to know our community. We want to get to our neighbors. We want to get to know our friends. We want to make sure that we're all on the same page around this great country. And we believe it. I tell you all the time, I just spent five years living in India, and I maintain I'm living in the greatest country in the world. The funny thing was that I came to this country when I was very young, six, seven years old. And in 2006, I, you know, I'd been thinking about going to India, thinking about going to India, and it took me two or three years to convince my wife, and I finally convinced her, let's go to India. She said, I'm not going, and I finally convinced her. <laughs> and we got on the plane, and I kept telling my wife and children, we're going home. We're going to India, we're going home. And it took me a while to realize that we left home. Because innately, innately, intuitively, instinctively, I'm just like you. I'm just like you in every way, shape, and form. You know? So, I really, we appreciate Joyce the opportunity to be here. We thank you. And um, it's a pleasure <coughs> to be here. Uh, we, I guess you're going to grow us now. going to grow. <laughs> you go first. We, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but we're almost out of time. <laughs>